Honored to be here with Dexter, um, magician on the soldering iron and creator of bunches of PCBs to hack all kinds of embedded systems. Um, I'm Carsten. We both work at the same little research lab in Berlin where we take apart pretty much any hardware put in front of us, including the occasional silicon chip focus of today's talk. We want to not introduce any cutting edge hacks, neither break something that wasn't broken before, but instead give an introductory talk to chip hacking to make you understand what other mostly very well equipped labs have been doing and are continuing to do um, as, as one focus of today's talk. Um, the second focus is going to be the introduction of a tool set um, to do microchip analysis on the cheap um, set of tools that Dexter has been putting together over the last couple of months that will hopefully enable some of you to join the um, surprisingly small group of people who do analyze silicon chips at the lowest levels. We want to draw attention um, to microchip analysis, mostly because we're observing a, a trend that more and more functionality is being um, hidden away from users inside hardware, um, basically reverting um, lots of progress that the free and open software movement has made um, in opening devices to uh, creative users. Those devices are now being locked down further and further through secrets hiding in chips, and people have a harder and harder time understanding how these, um, how these protection mechanisms work. They have a harder time uh, circumventing them to, to deploy their creative extensions and especially have a harder time analyzing these devices for the unintentional vulnerability or intentional backdoor. So there's more um, research and analysis and more people with skills and tools to execute these analysis needed to, again, um, open hardware um, to the level that everybody should be used to, to bring back the, um, the control to whoever purchased the device rather than leaving the control to whoever manufactured the device. Right? Um, Applications that are chip enabled or chip secured these days range from really any, any hardware, um, appliances in the household, smartphones, tablets, computers now with, with secure boot, all the way to maybe cars. And with the exception of cars, perhaps, all of these devices should be customizable and should be extensible. Basically, a tool is missing um, that would be the equivalent to a decompiler and disassembly chain with, in software where anybody is free to, to look at a piece of software, um, derive its functionality, check for backdoors, and change the software as they wish. Um, hardware hackers have, over the last couple of years, created a bunch of tools to uh, do this level of analysis um, on PCB boards, basically where different chips communicate with one another and where functionality needs to be derived to, to understand how to extend the hardware as such. Um, but those efforts are increasingly being defeated by, by more chip integration by more and more periphery moving inside a single silicon die and then locking out um, the, the, the anal analysts who may have so far always succeeded in finding, for instance, a JTAG or other debug port to extract software and then look at the software, nonetheless change it perhaps even. Right? So we want to introduce some methodology tools and a few things for you to try at home um, to look into those chips and start chasing the software uh, where it's currently hiding and make sure to keep whoever created the software honest and, and to keep the, the hardware it's deployed in as open as possible. Um, as I said earlier, this is an introductory talk to some research that has already happened in a lot of cases. It's also a complementary talk to, to another line of research uh, presented at, at a bunch of um, the congresses. Um, those were focused on extracting functionality from chip, basically the equivalent to stat static software analysis. Um, where you take a chip, take it apart, look at its different parts, reason about how these different parts interact, and then derive, for instance, a secret cryptographic cipher. 
That's the one line of research that Starbuck was fundamentally pushing and um, that's building up on a, on a tool set by, by um, Nitram, the DGATE software. Um, there's a second line of research, um, mostly driven by anal analysis labs, um, the most prominent public voice of which, of course, is Chris Danofsky from FlyLogic, but a bunch of other labs also do this more in, in secret. Um, these, uh, these labs execute the equivalent to dynamic analysis, where the, the chip is kept alive and kept running and is being observed as it executes certain things with the goal of extracting its software or perhaps changing its software, but more often just extracting the software, including certain secrets you need to um, enable extra functionality or understand some secret protocol. Um, the camp last year saw a confluence of those two where static analysis led to an easy uh, way of extracting memory from a smart card. Um, but other than that, those two worlds have been pretty much separate. Um, what has been missing so far, at least from my perspective, is an explanation on how these failure analysis labs actually go about extracting um, the um, the code, and that's the missing piece we want to add today. In addition, we want to show how, to, how their tools can be um, scaled down significantly um, to then apply to at least some older chips and being able to analyze those. Um, to be presented in three acts. Uh, first, some, some basic methodology and um, kind of the theoretical foundation behind these attacks. Um, Dexter will then explain um, his setup um, for doing very low cost analysis, and I'll let um, at the end a discussion on uh, how professional laboratories with much better equipment um, maintain an, uh, an arms race with the chip manufacturers and what they are currently doing in, uh, in, in terms of attacks and defenses. Sounds good so far? All right, then. <laughs> um, to understand how you exploit a chip, let's first create a, uh, a mental model of, of how a chip, um, any chip really, um, executes and where the, the perfect sweet spot would be to intercepting secret information. Um, a chip, at least to me, uh, is, is composed of two main components. There's the memory that stores a program or data, secrets for instance, um, as well as a CPU that can execute one, one little segment of the memory at a time. So those two interact in that um, a memory instruction is fetched, um, uh, an instruction is fetched from memory and stored in what would be an input buffer into the CPU, it's called instruction latch. And then from this instruction latch, it's, um, it's uh, flowing into the CPU, triggering all kinds of little functions, depending on what instruction it is. It will do something mathematical, or it will move data around from registers and so forth. And um, this instruction will, in almost all cases of instructions, then increment the program counter um, for the memory then to, to provide the next instruction, and that gets executed, and the program counter is once again incremented and so forth. So um, there's this, this um, back and forth between the CPU and the memory. There are certain instructions, and very few indeed, um, that change this flow um, by not just incrementing the program counter to the next memory address, but rather overriding it with something completely different. So a jump instruction would override it with a, um, with a, a register content, and for instance, um, a um, return instruction would override it with the top of the stack. So take a completely different address, write it in the program counter, provide this as the address into the memory, and the next instruction being fetched is somewhere completely different. Of course, those are needed to make any interesting kind of program, otherwise it would just execute singularly all through the memory. Right? Um, let's assume now, and Dexter will explain how that's actually um, happening, let's assume that um, we, could, we could intercept data flowing on these data bus wires. They're pretty long wires connecting um, pretty disjunct parts of the chip, so there's a good chance that somehow this, uh, these wires can be tapped with little needles. Now, if we did put a needle on, on one of these bits, what would we actually see? 
boot up the, the chip, we'd see it go through some kind of self-test routine. It would maybe write things to memory, read them back, check that the, that the memories are working. It would set up some internal um, peripheries. It um, may set up memory maps, <coughs> the MMU, and so forth. <coughs> And then it would start executing the actual program. And it could be as simple as going through an infinite loop until somebody provides the right PIN number and only then executing the actual program. So on this um, data bus wire, we may not see anything interesting as far as the program is concerned. Or it may be a TV setup, um, smart card, um, where, where it now waits for some server communication, some data sent through the satellite. Um, it would decrypt that data um, and then, and then w work its program. Um, so in almost all cases, it needs external simulation to do anything interesting, and oftentimes even external secrets that in analysis setting you usually don't have. So you only see very small parts of this program. <clears throat> Why is that? Of course, because of these flow-altering instructions that maintain a little loop around something non-interesting, preventing the program from ever going anywhere uh, interesting. So an attacker's goal now would be to um, disable all these instructions that make it jump around and rather um, prefer instructions that singularly increment the program counter and um, walk through memory, as Kristanovsky says. Um, and there's two ways of achieving that, at, at, very, at the least two ways, two kind of generic ways. Um, so again, we, we have this instruction latch that's actually just a series of, of flip-flops um, that's being populated from the memory with instructions, and whenever it receives a trigger, it's usually referred to as a clock, but really it isn't a clock, it's not um, symmetric, as it has this different uh, D different pauses depending on how long instructions execute. So basically, it receives a trigger whenever the CPU asks for a new instruction, it's still called a clock. And only then the instruction is moved from the input to the output, kind of like a, a triggered conveyor belt that keeps the output static until it receives this trigger, and whenever the trigger is received, moves whatever currently is at the input to the output. Right? Now let's assume there's a NOP instruction executing right now. A NOP instruction does very, very little. In fact, only two things. So it doesn't have any logic. You know NOP, no operation, right? Um, it increments the program counter because it needs to move on to the next instruction, waits a little while for the memory to be able to populate the new instruction into this input buffer, and then triggers that the NOP instruction um, is executed um, uh, it's it's uh, moved through this conveyor belt, right? And then whatever new instruction um, is in also executes its CPU logic. Let's assume now for a second that we could um, that we could um, prevent the trigger from reaching the latch. So now the knob instruction executes. It increments its program counter. Some other instruction is being moved to the input of the latch, but the trigger is never received. So the CPU will assume that it triggered, and it will fetch the next instruction on the output of this ledge, which still is the knob instruction. And it will increment the program counter once again. And it will do this ad infinitum, walking through the entire memory. Right? So one way of, um, of making this chip go linearly through the memory, independent of whether you, you actually have the access rights, whether you typed in the right PIN number, whether you, you uh, provided the right server communication. Uh, one way of doing this is by, by holding this, this clock input stable um, and preventing the triggers. Right? So this is an attack now that only takes two needles, one for listening to one of these data buses, and the other for keeping the clock in a stable state after a certain instruction is fetched. Now, this first needle will have to then, after intercepting the first bit, intercept the second bit, and so forth. And then you puzzle together these different pieces of the instruction. Um, and this, in almost all architectures, allows you to uh, make the, make, make the um, chip, smart card, whatever you have, spill out its entire memory content. Um, in some cases, this is, these clock 
lines are pretty well hidden or there's even protections on them where the, where the chip notices when, when the trigger is not being populated. So people come up with, with alternative ways of doing this. Uh, one very elegant one, I think, that works against some instruction sets is to change the instructions as such. So you allow it to propagate through the latch but you keep one bit stably 0, 1, depending on the architecture and which bit it is, um, to never allow any flow-altering instructions. So in the ARM architecture, all these instructions have a certain bit set, and if you, if you reverse that bit, it will always be some other instruction, oftentimes an, an illegal instruction. They, they, don't, they don't exist, but the CPU kind of moves on, increments the program counter nonetheless and walks through memory, doesn't really do anything meaningful anymore other than providing all that data you want. Right? There's a couple other ways um, on, on other smart cards, especially how to force this, but that's the basic idea. Force the chip to execute meaningless instructions and never jump anywhere. Right? Um, that's the basic idea. It gets a little bit more complicated in cases where uh, memory management is involved, because this, of course, will only ever walk through the memory currently mapped. And if there's other memory segments, this attack may need to be executed several times when, when the, the, the right portions of the memory are mapped in. Right? So good so far. Um, so. Dexter is not going to explain um, how this putting needles on the chip business actually works and, and what tools are involved in that. Um, the, the attack he's describing is slightly different in that um, we don't actually have to tap the, the data bus and all that on, on the chip he chose as an example, um, but the same principle applies. You overwrite a bit, in this case a fuse bit, and the chip loses its protection capabilities. Okay, let's start. Uh, this is a basic setup we currently have in use. I actually have constructed this um, out of um, off-the-shelf components and some uh, self-made components as well. Um, the most eye-catching part you can see is the microscope itself. You see the microscope head mounted uh, to, uh, to girder. It's completely static and not movable. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a specialized microscope, it's, it's specialized for the probing task. Um, yeah. Uh, it's specialized in that it has a large working distance, so the, yeah. the microscope is, is pretty far from, from what it's looking at. Yeah, it's, uh, it's about the working distance. The objectives are actually what is specialized. The rest is um, a normal thing here. And you also might notice this large XY uh, stage. Uh, it basically consists of an, a large um, steel plate. Steel because it's magnetic, and our microposition, as you see on the left there, is, uh, has also a magnetic base, and it's also very handy because you can uh, stick with little ma tiny magnets, you can uh, f hold a target and uh, microposition and other things in place. Um, yeah, the micropositioner um, itself is uh, a professional variant. Uh, yeah, better show it uh, here on the display with the mouse. This is the micropositioner, and it has uh, these green knobs uh, to move it around in uh, to move it around in X, Y, and Z direction. Um, this one can be bought for about uh, 300 euro, but the prices are varying from 300 euro to maybe 3,000 euros. Um, you, you can spend basically infinite money on that. But on, for 300 euro, you get one uh, a good entry level unit. Um, the unit itself is um, extended, uh, where's the mouse here, with an arm. On the end of the arm, um, there's a little um, holder. This holds, that holds the needle in place, and uh, the needle, when it, uh, uh, the needle touches the chip surface, it uh, directly touches the tiny wire trace directly on the chip. And the other end of the needle uh, is connected uh, to a buffer. Yeah, um, this buffer has basically the task to um, amplify the weak signals on the chips. The tiny transistors you find on, on chips are only made to uh, to drive these uh, tiny traces, 
And if you hook up a large uh, wire, then the stray capacity and uh, the input capacity of the uh, measurement equipment uh, may disturb the ship functionality. That is why you need a, a buffer here. And yeah. And also, we equipped the arms. When you buy a micropositioner, the arm is usually um, it's, it's usually a piece of metal with maybe some uh, some screw to hold something in place. That is not really suitable. So I extended uh, this arm with some p with two pieces of, uh, of of PCB material, and I also added two screws to to clamp this uh, needle into that. And uh, it's fully insulated from the rest of the setup. That is actually actually uh, very important. Um, the needle itself, it's made of tungsten. Uh, you might know tungsten is not solderable. Uh, so we had uh, here we have a removable connection here. Uh, you can just uh, fix it. Uh, oh, it's fun. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's it's removable. It's meant to be removable. And it's glued everything in epoxy. After that, uh, a measurement amplifier is uh, bringing everything to TTL levels to hook up a logic analyzer. Um, there's also something important what we need. Uh, we, of course, we need a target. In our case, it's a, a PIC-12C508A. It's a very old microcontroller. It's a UV erasable microcontroller. If you buy it in plastic package, then it's of course not erasable. Then it's an OTP version, but you can buy it in ceramic uh, uh, casing. Um, it has a copy. It has a copy protection fuse. It's one fuse that, uh, if you program it, it's EEPROM memory, one bit EEPROM memory. You program it, and then the con controller refuses uh, the readback functionality. You cannot read back uh, the code anymore. It's already hacked. Um, mostly, when you hack one of these devices, you would use a UV attack. UV, att uh, UV light erases the microcontroller, including the fuse. But when you cover the EEPROM memory, when you find it on the ship and you cover it with paint, then uh, it cannot be erased anymore. But the fuse are, are getting erased, and so you can uh, unlock the chip and read back the, its contents. The cables you see here are running down to a programmer. The red little thing is an is, is e programmer. Um, that is because um, we need something to stimulate the chip. Whenever you probe something, not only in this case, whenever, when you probe something, you have, to you have to set the chip in function. You have to give it an environment where it can work. Con basically, controlled environment. If you do the thing that Carsten, managed, uh, uh, Carsten mentioned, then you also have to take care about uh, clock stability and uh, synchronizing things. Uh, yeah. In this case, the chip's already opened. Opening chips is not that easy, um, but, it, uh, yeah. but it's doable, even for a hobbyist. Um, on the left thing, it's quite funny. Uh, I opened it with a screwdriver by ah, mouse, mouse, here's the mouse. Here's the chip, and here's the screwdriver. I opened it uh, by prying it. Um, you, just, uh, uh, you just apply the, uh, uh, the screwdriver on the, um, on the joint where the ceramic package is. It's joined together. It has a top and a bottom uh, part. And uh, you knock it softly with the screwdriver, and the package uh, top is flipping off. And if you are very careful with that, and if you have luck, then all the contact legs uh, are kept intact. Uh, hopefully, um, but if one leg loses, that happened, uh, then I use, just use another micropositioner to replace that. Um, yeah. On the other side, uh, we have a, a, a controller that is etched. It's etched. It is, has been etched with fuming nitric acid. And the good thing about fuming nitric, nitric acid is that it leaves the bonding wires and the chip itself comp fully intact. Bonding wires are the tiny little wires that connect the, the pads, the bonding pads on the chip itself with the outer legs. It's a connection to the outside. And it's important to have that because you want to hook up your working environment, your, uh, your programmers, uh, and everything that is needed to, to make the chip working. Yeah, in this case, um, yeah, we didn't do that by ourselves because fuming nitric, uh, nitric acid is very, very toxic. 
Um, and uh, yeah, the fumes are also very toxic. Um, and it's not available to the average hobbyist because of these terrorist thingies. Uh, yeah, some, some people used to build bombs with that. Uh, yeah, you, uh, but I, anyway, I can give you uh, uh, the, uh, I can tell you how it is done. You just heat up the chip, apply a drop of this fuming nitric acid, it adds edge the bitch, then you rinse it in acetone, and uh, you, you repeat the process over and over again until uh, the result is good. Uh, we also have um, another method that is not depicted here, but you can use colophonium that is mentioned in previous talks before. Um, you just boil the chip in colophonium for about an hour and then you rinse it in acetone. But, uh, uh, and then the problem is about this, you lose all the bonding wires and you have to replace it, uh, uh, them somehow in the, uh, after that. You, in some cases, if you only need ground and, and VCC for the chip and maybe a clock line, then it's okay, then you can use other micropositioners uh, to compensate it, but in... Uh, yeah, for, for the uh, normal hobbyists, it's not really feasible. You, you, can, you can acquire a, re a bonding station, then you're out of trouble, but this would increase the cost very high and uh, it's not feasible for the average hobbyist. Uh, yeah. what's, what's important to mention is that professional labs will etch open chips like depicted on the right side for about 50 bucks. So that yeah. shouldn't be uh, a hurdle, even yeah. if you don't want to touch the, the assets themselves. Yeah, we did, uh, we did it so. We sent it in and paid $50 per chip, and that is what we got back. Um, when the chip is open, um, yeah, we have, to we have to contact these uh, tiny little traces somehow. Um, unfortunately, they are, they are protected with a, with a layer of uh, basically glass. Uh, the chip is uh, consisting mostly of glass, of course, it's, yeah, it's, it, it all is built up on, on a silicon wafer, um, but then layer by layer is applied in the manufacturing process, and after that it's sealed with the passivation layer, it's silicon dioxide, and it protects it from oxidizing. And there's uh, matters of choice for the average hobbyist, <laughs> again. Uh, you um, can penetrate the passivation layer using a scratching technique. And how it works is very easy. You um, put the a needle right next to the trace, not onto, right next to the. Because on non planarized chips, um, by the, uh, uh, the, on non planarized chips, there's no, not taken care in any way to. Uh, to balance these uh, hollows and hills they are building, which are building up on the chip. And you have this uh, hill of uh, silicium dioxide on it. And if you move it forward and back, you stress the material and at one point it will break. And then the, uh, it, it, it appears to look like this in the end. When, it has bro when it's broken and then the trace is uh, ready to get contacted with the needle. You can, in most cases, you can just move the needle back and then it's contacted. Okay. There's also another option available. Um, when you want to professionalize yourself, you can uh, up, uh, add a laser to your microscope. <laughs> Um, this is a very, very uh, expensive uh, me method uh, because uh, laser cost uh, is a very costly installation. And also the objectives um, I have to be corrected for, the cert for certain wavelengths. You get objectives for infrared light, uh, they are optimized for infrared light or for UV light. Um, and these optics are very, very expensive. So if you acquire a laser, you have nothing in the beginning. You have to also acquire all these optics. Yeah, um, it's completely not affordable for hobbyists, um, even because of these uh, special things you need. Um, the handling is sometimes a bit difficult because you might if handling is not proper, it's not properly handled, maybe then you might destroy structures you want to destroy. The same applies to scratching as well. If you make a mistake, you 
might destroy stru structures next to it and then you lose it, uh, maybe you lose the chip in the beginning this often happens but if you have uh, some practice then uh, you get better and better and better and yeah then it's no problem anymore uh, yeah one word to scratching again it's uh, only feasible for traces that are not in a dense area of the chip. If the traces are running very dense and it's, you have no space to perform this, then the laser is the ideal choice for you. Okay, uh, let's uh, now come over for the, uh, to the fun part. Uh, we want to actually use our probing station to exploit a real existing chip. Uh, yeah, every kind of these attacks uh, starts with an imaging process because you want to know your target, you want to have an overview image of it. This is not done with, with, the, with the microscope you've seen before, it's done with a uh, much cheaper microscope um, for, for, uh, uh, which is optimized for imaging. I think it's 2,000 euro, about 2,000 euro uh, for microscopes that is capable to produce such images. Um, after I've done imaging, um, you can try to analyze uh, the structures you see. In our case, we have focused on the fuses. It's not uh, the case that we uh, didn't try to uh, do uh, the linear readout thing Carsten mentioned, but uh, yeah, it's not visible on the image. But here, I didn't found any uh, point uh, where I could tap the output lines from the EEPROM. So I focused on the fuses. And it's quite surprising. The fuses are quite large structures on the chip. Um, you might expect that fuses uh, oh, there was, uh, are uh, a tiny structure, must be, uh, should be a tiny structure on the chip, like an average uh, gate or something. But uh, yeah, they are actually very large. Here, you see them. These are the fuses. And you can identify fuses uh, by basically applying two methods. One easy way is you just uh, take a bit of paint and cover the chip. And then you check if you can erase it. And when you cannot erase the fuses anymore, then you uh, know that the fuses must, be, uh, fuses must be underneath the part that you have previously covered with paint. I did so and I um, could prove that the fuses are right in, uh, in this area here. Not in this, <laughs> I expected before, accidentally. Okay, so another idea to, fi another idea to find m fuses and memories on the chip is uh, to look where the VPP voltage is coming from. In this case, well, easy, it comes from, out, from an outside pin. And um, yeah, you just trace the VPP, it's not visible, it comes from this pin. I traced it down, here's the red line where the VPP line goes, and it ends up here, right where the fuses are. Because, you know, fuses are one bit memory, EEPROM, and EEPROM means programming voltage. So once you know where the fuses are, you want to find the output lines of the fuse to overdrive. Okay, this is uh, um, no, when, when you reverse engineer chips, especially it's mentioned in the talks before, we have this polishing thing. That is what I didn't, I didn't hear. I didn't polish here. Uh, I just took my overview image and looked what, uh, what traces could be the output lines of the fuses. And then I probed these ones. And it was an easy setup. I just uh, erased the chip, probed the line, see if it's a constant level, high in this case. EPRO memory is normally, outputs normally in high level when it's unprogrammed. And then I programmed the certain fuse. And when it dropped on the oscilloscope screen, I see it was uh, a zero level in the end. Then I, I have the, uh, uh, pr uh, pretty ma uh, uh, it's pretty capable that it is, this is the fuse I'm looking for. And that is what I've done. Uh, yeah. uh, it turned out to be not that easy because the output line of the EEPROM is running in one of the deeper layers. But 
it still could be found. Um, and this image here is uh, taken by Kristanowski, but I received it after uh, um, I found the fuse, so I, I really can confirm that I found it uh, really by myself. Uh, so um, this is the view through the microscope. This is what the attacker sees. Um, it's a, the image is a bit blurry. It's taken with a not that uh, professional camera. Uh, the human eye sees a much better image, but it's uh, you see the needle. The needle here, it's a blurry shadow. You, you always see the shadows uh, that the needle is throwing on the ship's surface. And it taps uh, this wire here. This wire coming down from here to here, and here is the tap. This is also done using scratching. I did, uh, didn't use the laser here. Um, it worked, even, th even uh, though if it was um, in one of the deeper layers. This was actually the only point where I could penetrate uh, this line. All, on all other places, it was covered with top metal. Um, yeah. When you get the needle in position, um, some folks prefer TTL buffers as buffer circuit. I prefer an operational uh, amplifier and voltage follower mode because it's more transparent electrically. Um, and to know if I'm in the right position, it's just easy. Uh, I look at the noise level of the needle, and when the needle is coming in contact with the chip surface and uh, on, the, on any wire, hopefully at uh, the, uh, the right one, the, volta the, the, the noise level is dropping because the chip is grounded through the EEPROM programmer circuit. That is how, then, then I can f know for sure that uh, I have contact uh, the chip and I can start my measurements. Yeah. So, here, uh, yeah. Okay, you might think, yeah, using this expensive microscope, it's still expensive, yeah, why we call it low cost microprobing then? Uh, yeah, this is what I have at home. This is really low cost, this is my uh, private microscope. Um, cost me about 2,000 euro. Feasible for a hobbyist. I really like it. It's very, very old. It's an old size vertival. And what I did then is uh, I enlarged the, ob uh, the, object, ob uh, the, the ob uh, object table. And yeah, it was about 70 euro because I w didn't want to ruin my original object table, so I got a new one, and it was about 70 euro. Yeah, and and uh, uh, aluminium plate covered with a steel, uh, with a thin steel uh, tin, because I want to. Uh, I wanted to have. Uh, to, uh, I wanted to be magnetic because all the micropositions in our setups are always uh, magnetic based. Yeah. Um, Okay, um, one word to the little tiny PCB here. See, this is the other end. Uh, no, it's, it's the other um, part of my uh, voltage, uh, of my measurement amplifier. It's all on a PCB, which uh, is capable to uh, uh, apply the, the uh, voltage needed for the voltage, uh, needed for the uh, operation amplifier and the level shifting circuit and comparator circuit, all microcontrollable USB port and so on. And I will publish it under an open source license when it's finished. But if you are interested, you can ask me. Yeah, there's one major drawback we didn't talk about yet. The specialized optics we use on our microscope in the company, they have a, uh, they have a larger lens on the bottom. On an imaging microscope, you have very, very tiny lenses at the end, which are looking to the object itself. And on, uh, on the specialized optic, it, optics, it's different. It's, it's larger. And the numerical apertures, which is basically, uh, which has an effect on the working distance, is also lower <coughs> in the most case. This, uh, on, the, on an imaging microscope, it's exactly the opposite. And that is because I have only a working distance of two millimeter here. Um, but anyway, it's also possible to, to, uh, to maneuver the needle through this two millimeter gap down to the chip. 
and the, the experience was basically the same. Um, it was a bit shaky, but anyway, it worked. Uh, and that's the important thing about it. It worked, and um, uh, it is feasible for under 3,000 euros. That means that an average hobbyist can do microprobing in, its, in his basement. So, uh, yeah, that's it. That's my part is done now. <laughs> Yeah, applause indeed. That, that may very well be the, the cheapest probing setup so far. And I hope it's ins inspirational to a couple of you, especially those with microscopes already, to add in those uh, remaining pieces and start probing some simple chips yourself. So this was a pretty simple chip. It didn't try to, to do much in terms of hardware security. It had uh, logic level countermeasures that Dexter so commended. So let's look for the remaining couple of minutes at, um, at the how to overcome the restrictions of this setup with more professional setups. So this setup would run into two, um, two, two dead ends. Um, first of all, chips get increasingly small in terms of feature size. So the structures you're trying to probe get smaller and smaller over time, and uh, especially with the, the scratching, um, you, um, you don't really get through to these tiny structures anymore without destroying a bunch of other stuff on the chip. Um, the second limitation is that some chips actively try to fight this kind of probing with, uh, with defense structures, um, and those, of course, um, are built with uh, setups like this in mind, and they are pretty effective against them. There is one tool, though, um, that gets around both these restrictions, and that's called the focused ion beam. It's a pretty ingenious tool. Um, it's, um, it shoots... Uh, accelerated ions onto a surface, for instance, a chip surface, and in, an, um, in a, a normal mode, they just bounce off the chip, and depending on how they bounce, um, they are collected and then uh, made into an image, basically like an electron microscope, uh, where you shoot electrons, but in this case with ions, same system applies, and images come out like this, where um, this is really the, um, the di different, different ions having bounced off differently off this chip surface um, and then being recognized as, as uh, higher or lower. You can see a 3D structure here. Um, the, um, beyond the, the electron microscope, which could also have produced this image, um, it has certain active operation modes. Um, if you accelerate the ions a little more, um, they don't just bounce off the surface, they actually shoot out atoms off the surface. So they destroy whatever you're looking at slowly, slowly. It's milling through the chip. Um, and you can see how um, there are certain cuts in here where um, the, the FIP has already cut into the chip. Right? Um, so that's the, the one active operation mode. The second operating mode is to um, put in these, these ionized gases uh, certain other materials, for instance, platinum gas, and the platinum ions, they'll, um, they'll be thrown onto the surface and they stick wherever they touch the chip. So with these platinum ions, you can build up structures. And putting those together is really surgery on the chip. So what has been done here is, um, and this, this was done by, by Kristinovsky of FlyLogic, um, he, he milled in these, um, the, these boxes, the big boxes, and then um, milled in um, a few more holes to see where on the chip he is exactly. For instance, this is a small cut that looks deeper down and sees the actual metal wires that are running um, probably two layers down from where he started. Um, and one of these metal wires he was most interested in, I think it's this one, um, and he drilled right over here a small hole with the same technique, shooting ions and, and drilling down um, all the way to the metal. And this is similar to, to what the laser achieved earlier. But this hole is so tiny, you can't possibly stick a needle in. So then he started throwing platinum at it and filled the hole with platinum, so it's conductive with the metal underneath. And to make it e even more convenient for the needle, build this little ring again of platinum. So if you stick in a needle anywhere in this ring, it should connect to the metal underneath. 
Right? So this is enabling then for somebody um, like Dexter to just use the standard needles and, and get the data out of this chip. Um, he did some cleanup then. You see these cuts. This is so that the two metal pieces are not actually connected um, and, and a whole bunch of, of uh, small other things. So this is, this is really a magic how, how these tools are operated. But you can imagine doing anything now with a chip, right? Even connecting different wires that are previously not connected. So you do edits on the circuit. That's what it's called. And this is actually why these tools exist in the first place, because chip manufacturers, as they build chips, do errors, right? First versions of the chips always are error prone, and then they need to reroute some wires, they need to cut some wires, they need to create new ones, and these tools are coming out of these chip manufacturing facilities, but now they're also being used for, um, well, the euphemism is failure analysis, so trying to find exploits. Um, the chip manufacturers know that, of course, and they try to prevent um, people from doing anything, scratching, lasering, fibbing to chips through active protection. Um, and the most common and most wasteful, because it takes a whole um, metal layer, uh, is called a mesh. So a mesh is a, uh, a snake that runs all across the chip, and in fact, in most uh, in most chips, several snakes kind of interleaved. Um, and it measures whether the snake's beginning and end is connected before it executes anything interesting. So if you start um, drilling through this, this top layer to get to something interesting underneath, the chip notices that the snake now is, is broken and will refuse to operate or even uh, do uh, more, more active alerting. Um, and usually the, the mesh is tight enough so you can't get through in the middle. Some people try and succeed by fibbing very carefully, just in between two tracks, kind of cutting a little bit on the edges of both tracks and then cutting through, but that's, that's really advanced. Um, there, are more <laughs> there are more generic diff um, counter attacks against these meshes, though. Um, so th this chip, for instance, even has two uh, active protection meshes. To get to these latches we looked at earlier, the really interesting structures, you not only have to um, penetrate the, the mesh above, also this metal shield. Fortunately, this is not a mesh, so if you, you can just cut through. But again, if you try to do this with scratching, you'd mess up all kinds of stuff around it. So this also asks for, for a fit. Now, how do you defeat um, a, a mesh? So here, here's an example of, of, of mesh lines. Um, and again, they're very, very tight, so hard to probe in between. You'd rather uh, want to cut a little window um, in the middle to get to, for instance, the latch clock, uh, but then have to make the mesh logic believe that the mesh hasn't been breached. Um, here is color coded the, the connectivity of this mesh. So these snakes go, you know, the purple one goes something like this, and the other colors interleave with it. Um, and if and it will test whether um, the first purple is somehow connected to the last purple, but it doesn't have to go through the snake necessarily. So if you cut a window in the middle and you bridged a left purple with a right purple and the left yellow with a right uh, yellow, um, it would still have connectivity. And again, the FIP, with all its capabilities of cutting and then de depositing platinum, can actually do this. That, this has been the most common attack against um, modern smart cards of the last years. People just figuring out how these mesh circuits are connected and then cutting windows in and bridging them. It's a couple more interesting, from my perspective, attacks, because this is simple, right? Like, conceptually simple, it's just a lot of work finding where to cut and then actually executing it without destroying the chip. So the, the more interesting attacks to me are those that defeat the logic behind the mesh. For instance, uh, one family of smart cards, what it does is, uh, as soon as it notices that the mesh is breached, it will bulk erase the, the memory, so all secrets are being deleted. Right? And next time you power on the chip, um, it's worthless pretty much to the attacker. Um, programming, as Dexter said before, takes a certain voltage. Um, usually on the smart cards, it's not supplied externally. It's generated on the, on the chip through charge pumps. But of course, these charge pumps can also, with the FIP, be cut off from the memory. So even if a bulk erase um, circuit triggers, that doesn't necessarily it will, I mean it, it will bulk erase if the voltage is missing. So if you, if you cut the mesh and then also cut the supply voltage into the memory, that defense is defeated. Right? 
Some other chips is a different family, um, take a long time, and it's, uh, it's a, a magic to me why a chip can take so long thinking about whether the mesh is breached, but it takes a couple thousand clock cycles to decide, yes, the mesh is breached, and that's enough <clears throat> to execute some part of the attack reset the chip, then execute the next part of the attack. So um, the, the logic is, is often easier to defeat than the whole fibbing business, especially as, as these become more interwoven or um, become three-dimensional, where you'd have to um, breach two different levels. But the, the arms race goes on. Um, up the sleeve of, of current and future smart cards are things like analog meshes, um, <clears throat> where the, the simple connect different lines that belong together attack is defeated through supplying an analog signal and then actually measuring the antenna capabilities of these lines that, of course, are, are changed through, through the edits. Um, other things that are already found in at least one smart card is redundant um, distribution of data where you'd have to intercept the data in different places at the same time, basically defeat two different cores with the same attack at the same time, and those cores, they kind of help each other stay secure. Um, it's, um, it, it may sound wasteful because it, it doubles the resource footprint, but of course it's much less wasteful on, on the chip um, than adding a whole metal layer. So um, I like the idea. I'd like to see somebody uh, look at it more closely, though. So the arms race goes on, and um, it has... Um, it, it has gone on to, to a point where only a few specific labs can now um, work on, on the most recent smart cards um, because of all these meshes and whatnot. Um, one new idea is emerging currently has been in the discussion for a couple of years. Um, Theo Berlin, uh, the first uh, who have been doing it academically very successfully, again with failure analysis rather than hacking in mind, but that, that may change. And the idea here is to, to approach the chip from the other side. So we're talking about the front side and the back side of a chip. So the front side is um, wh wh where all that, that glass uh, and, and the metal is, and the back side is just a, a relatively large plate of silicon that gives the chip mostly stability. So it doesn't have to be this big functionally. And all the techs so far have focused on, on coming from the front side, then breaching the mesh. This is a mesh. You see all these, these metal wires here on, on metal three. Uh, breaching the mesh somehow, and then drilling down to something on metal two or metal one. Um, is, this, is this graph self-explanatory enough? So uh, there's transistors on the, on the bottom here, um, basically gates. And uh, you, don't, you can't see the transistors in this picture, actually. But you see all the connecting structures. Um, on different layers and how they are kind of in a three-dimensional circuit all tied together. So people come from the front side, breach all security, and then tap on some of these wires. But the exact same information, of course, is available at those transistors that generate them in the first place. So an idea now is to, to come from the back side and tap the transistors right away. Um, this would really uh, defeat all meshes by definition because they are on the other side. There's actually no, no way of putting a mesh uh, on the back side. Uh, there's really no, no, no logic. And the transistors have to be the lowest layer, and they have to carry the information somehow. Um, the, it creates certain challenges around keeping the, the chip um, stable to operate as you, as you drill um, through and, and thin this, um, this um, the, the, the silicon too much, um, the, the chip stops running stably to supply certain extra clocks and whatnot. Um, but uh, in the arms race, this seems the most promising approach so far. I'm just mentioning to, to, to make it clear that uh, the chip manufacturers are far from winning the race. It's uh, more innovation, of course, is always needed on, on both sides. Um, but once this is available, uh, I think the attackers again have the upper hand, um, mostly because chip manufacturers haven't seen it coming um, fr from this direction. And then all chips that, that shipped this year and the last couple of years are again vulnerable. Um, so that was our brief rambling walk through, through the world of smart card and chip analysis. Um, hopefully this was inspiring enough for, for some of you with microscope or with, with 2,000 bucks to spare and buying a microscope to um, pick up one and, and start uh, probing some simple chips. Um, hopefully we, we can all 
can move forward this field and, and um, maintain the struggle with manufacturers and, and making the devices we pay money for our devices, right? And not allowing anybody to, to hide their software secret algorithms and backdoors and hardware any longer. Well, thank you very much. We have six more minutes for Q&A, so if you have any questions, please do line up behind the microphones over here, here and here. And while you line up, we'll have two quick questions from our ISC people. There was a question, um, I wonder which resolution for the microscope is advised? Hmm? What resolution is needed for the microscope, is that a question? Uh. Um, so. It, for, for the chip, we looked at a resolution somewhere between two and 500 power would be more than sufficient. So um, not the most expensive microscopes are needed. The, the, the most you can ever get optically is a, a magnification of something like 1500. Um, and that would be needed to, to breach chips of a, of a feature size of down to something like 200 nanometer, right, to give you a couple of numbers. But it really depends much on the chip you're looking at. Yeah, to, to the resolution, I can say, opt, uh, physically, a, a, a magnification over 1,000 is not really possible. The image gets blurry for uh, magnifications that are any higher. While you're leaving the room, please be a little bit more quiet. Thank you. The second question was, Carsten, did you try this on latest EC cards with wireless payment activation? <laughs> well, um, EC cards are, are, are usually pretty well-powered smart cards. In fact, in my opinion, much too well-powered smart cards. Their, their weaknesses are more on the protocol level. Uh, but yeah, this, uh, the, the fibbing attacks would work against them with plenty of experience and a couple of months of, of work per chip. Um, the simple attacks, no chance if you, if you touch an actual smart cards like the one in banking cards. Next question from the right-hand side uh, room microphone. I have two questions, one for Karsten and one for Dexter. Karsten first. Uh, if you go back one slide, uh, my question is about the last slide. You, you do, um, are talking about uh, backside fibbing here and chip thinning and this being a new attack, but I heard about this when working at a chip manufacturer in 2005, I think it was, 2006 maybe. Mm -hmm. um, it's been around for a while. Why, why is this technology just now being puzzling to me as well. So um, there are people who can pull this off. None of them are involved in security, though. Yeah, the, they, the, they, they will, were not security people. They, yeah, were, they, they were will very... measure properties of transistors, analog properties, so much harder to execute analyses than, than just intercepting bus bits. Um, but this hasn't been proven to work on a smart card with some security functionality. And it's about time that somebody does it. Sure. And my other question was, um, I'm interested in some more technical details on the on the low cost um, needle setups, um, the micro positioners, and the what kind of needles do you need? Is there any are there any special properties? Do you have to sh do I just take a sewing needle and sharpen it? What's the how do I get to to uh, the the fine point that I need for this work? Yeah, I can answer this. I think um, the needles we are used uh, we we used uh, are called tungsten tips. I think I will find that when you uh, search the net for that, it's, it's basically a very very simple needle. It they come already sharpened in uh, in a case, and you pick one, and basically after you have used it f a few times, they are worn. Then you throw it away. They are come ready, and we ta we just take them. And they are valuable. I think it's called tungsten tips. Um, I don't know how sharp it is, uh, but it's, uh, I think, I don't know its exact uh, numerical value for the, for the tip radius, but it's, uh, it's about the size of one of the traces you have seen. It's about, the tip has about the same size than one of these wire traces that the chip has. Interesting. And what, what can you say about the micro positioners? Uh, micro positioners. Uh, what's what's the particular question on that? 
I guess um, I guess I'm asking for a, for a longer a, a, a paper or, or a uh, how please to. keep your questions short. We only have one more minute. So the, left. the, the micro positioners we just found online from uh, some German guy in Texas. He um, he constructed them himself. He ships them for three hundred fifty dollars, I think. Um, they are for this type of of chip all you ever need. You also can try to uh, look on online auctions for Wentworth or Signatone. You find in, in the U.S. you find lots of cheap uh, supplies mm -hmm. from leftovers. We have time for one more question from the left-hand side microphone. Yeah, hello. Uh, uh, I wonder that you use this scratching method. Um, wouldn't it be possible to use a piezo uh, actor that uh, uh, gives I, a vibration to the probe? I uh, understand you want to do it like a dentist removing uh, yeah. Yeah, dirt from your teeth. Uh, yeah, um, we thought about that, but um, scratching is uh, it's, it's more, more feasible. I don't know how to attach a speaker and how to uh, make this supersonic stuff. Um, scratching is actually, you have full control with the micropositioner. You move it back and forth or you rub it aside of one of these trays and suddenly it breaks. It's, uh, it's doable and uh, I practice this very reliable in the last time. Uh, okay. Thank you everyone. Please give a warm round of applause to our speakers. Thank you.